we were in a pub afterwards, just in, a, in, in near Grantham. And uh, we were just finishing off a calculation because we wanted to show something, relate the end of the, uni the, end of the universe to, um, to dark energy as well. Uh, dark energy is the harbinger of this doom. And some guys were sort of piped up and they were like, what, you clearly see us doing some calculation, like, what are you doing? We're just showing that the universe is going to end. And they were like, what? <laughs> it's just like... We're going to start off talking about something probably 60 symbols people have heard about before. What have, where, what have we got here? Um, cosmological constant problem. So I want to sort of explain what it really is. It's often sort of understated or not explained properly in, um, you know, in, well, in lots of places, even within scientific seminars. Well, essentially, you think about um, the vacuum. You look at a vacuum and you say, right, has it got any energy? And you think, well, no, it's a vacuum, of course not. But actually, that's not true. Because quantum mechanically, what you find is, is that little particles essentially will pop in and out of existence. So you can think of them as just popping in and out of existence and essentially, you know, for literally an infinitesimal time and that, that gives the, the vacuum an energy. The question is how much? And it turns out it's an awful lot. If you use your standard calculations to calculate how much this is, you find that it's a huge amount of energy. In fact, it's so much energy that it would cause the universe to curve so much that it wouldn't even extend as far as the moon. People have tried to come up with models that, that sort of can suppress the amount of um, vacuum energy that, 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 that you get out. Uh, none of them have been particularly successful. So then you're sort of faced with a dilemma. Well, how did the universe, how is the universe so big then? And, um, and essentially what you say is, is, okay, I've just got a number, a quantity that can cancel off this vacuum energy. And it cancels it, it just cancels it off in very high ad hoc manner to a huge degree of accuracy. And that, you know, sort of this cancellation then allows the universe to be, to be much larger. It's, it's a dimensionful number. The thing that you, you throw in there is dimen has dimension. It has a dimension, four dimensions of mass, essentially. And it's, it's an energy density itself. So you're thinking you throw in is an energy density. And so it's that energy density you throw in just literally by hand that you would use to cancel off the energy density of the vacuum and to try and stop this, this huge amount of curving of the universe. But what actually is it, Tony, though? Because when you explained to me the vacuum energy, you told me what makes it. You, I know where it comes from. Mm. It's, it's particles popping in and out of existence, there's energy, therefore we've got this gravity. These are all things that I kind of sort of understand. I don't understand how you're just throwing this cancellation number, this density. Where's that coming from? Well, see, actually, this, this happens all the time in, in, in physics, um, actually. As soon as you start doing quantum mechanics, you can ask what the quantum corrections are doing to something. And, uh, for example, the charge of the electron, right? You can ask what the quantum corrections are to the charge of the electron. And you get all these infinities popping out, and then you have to add what we call a counter term to try and bring it back, drag it back to, to finite values. And so th this is a bit like that. It's like the counter term that you have to add. It seems like a cop out though. Like if I built my house on a dodgy foundation and it started leaning to the side, I couldn't just say, okay, number three, and everything's better. I would have to actually build stuff and fix things. I would have to physically do something to fix the deficiency. Well, I, I actually think that's a very good point, Brady, is that this is an, that's an excellent point, in fact. It sort of always cuts really to the true nature of the problem. The problem isn't really that you do these cancellations, it's that once you do them, that should be it. You, that, that, that choice that you made should be robust against any change in your, in your description of nature, if you like. So, um, so for, I just said that, you know, to calculate the, the, the charge of the electron, you're cancelling infinity. So why are we worrying with the cosmological constant about cancelling huge numbers? It's not certainly no worse than cancelling infinities. So, and, and that's where but the point that, that is generally missed about the cosmological constant problem, that's not really the problem. The true nature of the cosmological constant problem is something called radius of instability, which is this business where, you know, let's suppose I calculate what the vacuum energy is. Okay, so what's my description of nature? Well, I take a description that's valid down to the atomic scale, and I get one value for the vacuum energy, and I need to cancel that. So I choose this number to cancel that. Now I change my description later, I go down to, to the nuclear scale, and I get a completely different answer. Well, and I need to do the same cancellation to the same degree of accuracy. Then I go down to the subnuclear scale and I get a different answer again. And I need to do the same cancellation to the same degree of accuracy. And this is a completely unstable process. But surely there is only one vacuum energy. So 
just figure out which one you have to calculate and use that. Stop calculating it in different ways. Okay, so that, this this really hits something quite deep about, about nature. Do we believe in something called effective field theories? That's that you can literally trust. You don't need to know all these details of these uh, the physics. So if you're thinking about stuff that say super nuclear scales, you don't need to worry about the details below the subnuclear scale. So for example, do I, you know, Newton's constant, the law of gravity, is that the value of Newton's constant doesn't change whether I decide to cut my physics off at the atomic scale or the nuclear scale or, or whatever, right? It stays, it stays pretty robust. It's the same value. The problem with the cosmological constant is, is I'm changing that description. I'm having to keep retuning this value, this value that's really applying on, on the larger scales. It shouldn't need to worry about what's going on at the, uh, at the sub-nuclear scale and so on. And, 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 and as I move that description, once I made the choice, it should be robust. And it really isn't. So whenever this happens in nature, it, it signals, it, it has always signaled a lack of understanding of what's going on. We have the same problem with the mass of the Higgs, incidentally. It suffers from the same kind of problem that, it, you know, we keep having to retune, retune, retune. And in that case, supersymmetry solves it. In the case of the cosmological constant, well, it's a different story. You know, what, what is going on? Like the, this vacuum energy exists and has yeah. a quantity. Is it measured or is it something that's just modelled by people like you mathematically? Like we don't know what it actually, what its quantity is. Are we just kind of coming up with models and guessing what it is? So, okay, good question. Uh, so the vacuum energy does, changes in the vacuum energy have been measured. Now, what do I mean by that? Something called the Casimir effect where the, the value of the vacuum energy is sensitive to the boundary conditions of, of your, of, you say you have two plates and you, um, you change the, the separation, this and you can measure the change in the vacuum energy as you, as you change those boundary conditions. That's not really the true vacuum energy ground state of the universe. It's not really what, we're just talking about sort of a localized uh, thing there. Um, so, and it really is, all you, what you actually measure is, is that the effect of change in those boundary conditions. So in a sense, the vacuum energy, the thing that gives you that, is also the same kind of thing that gives you what we'll, what we'll call the vacuum energy of the universe, the true ground state of the universe. So, kind of yes, but not quite. So, so then, so now, one asks, so you asked about you know, measuring this sort of thing. So let's actually ask, how do you measure the cosmological constant? Okay, or how do you measure the vacuum energy? Well, tr the true vacuum energy, how do you measure it? Can I measure it in this room? Do you think I can measure it in this room? Well, I don't know, probably not because of all that noise from the construction out there. <laughs> but yeah. Right, well, you can't, right? How, right, so how about you try and measure? You might try and, one of the features of it is it's constant, okay? Uh, as, it, as you go through space, it stays constant. Now, um, well, I can look for something that's behaving constant in this room. But I don't know that when I open the door and go outside, that changes. You just said it was constant, so would the, isn't the vacuum energy in this room the same as it is in Ed's office? Of course it is, yes, it absolutely is. But, but when I find the thing that's something that's constant in this room, how do I know that that's the vacuum energy? It, it might not be, because it might stop being constant when I go outside the room, or when I go outside the galaxy, or whatever, right? So, or if I wait long enough, it might just change over time. But I just, you know, I, I have to wait long enough to see it, see it change. Well, then you weren't measuring the vacuum energy. Absolutely, you're not. So then how do you measure the vacuum energy? Can you measure it in a room? Clearly not, because you can't distinguish that scenario. Well, if it can't be distinguished, then it can never be measured. Well... Don't you have to come up with a vacuum energy me measuring device? Right, okay, so what, so what is that? Okay, the only way to measure the vacuum energy, true vacuum energy, is to consider the entire universe over all time. It's the only way. It's the only way you can truly guarantee that what you're talking about is constant. This, this observation, this, is, this was due to, uh, you know, the likes of Nimra, Kani, Hamed, Savas Demopoulos, big guns of physics, they made this observation that if you want to identify the vacuum energy, you have to scan all of space and all of time. Myself and, and a colleague of mine, uh, Nemanja, we, we, uh, we took what, Nima and Savas and, and friends had, had said, and we used it. We said, okay, the only way, if the only way that you can uh, measure the vacuum energy is to take the whole of space and time as one, then the only way you can properly cancel off vacuum energy is on the same level. So literally, we're demanding that this cancellation happens over the whole universe, that the universe knows about a number it needs to know, okay? 
Um, so we've managed to set up dynamics which occurs over the whole universe at once. So what we've done is we've, we've got this number, which is the number that, uh, you, you, that, that you use to cancel. And we've got another number which kind of knows about the masses of particles. And on the level of the whole universe, they talk to each other. And they do so, so no matter how you calculate the vacuum energy, whether you work at the atomic scale, whether you work at the whatever scale, those two will communicate in just the right way that they'll cancel. And so the problem of this, this issue we were talking about just goes away. This paper you've written, have you solved the problem or have you just written down, hey, don't worry everyone, the universe solves it on its own? So what we've done is we've found a way to basically deal with the problem as it was first formulated. That it, it, and it's, it's almost criminally simple. It doesn't require any huge change. Locally, physics just looks like uh, you know, Einstein's relativity, Einstein's general relativity. There's no change there. Why? Because we're changing. We, only, we change Einstein's theory on a global level as the universe as a whole. Right? We don't play with it locally. So locally we get all the great predictions of Einstein's theory, but the change is done as a whole because it had to be done on that level. Now, the, um, the funny thing is, because we're sort of, as I described, we've got this way of getting the, the number that you need to cancel, this classical value of the cosmological constant, and the particle masses, we get them to communicate in a certain way. Like I said, on the universe as a whole. And what that means is it turns out that the particle masses are, uh, are actually related to the space-time volume of the universe. And in fact, as you make the space-time volume of the universe, so basically its spatial size and how long it exists for, as you make that bigger as a whole, then the particle masses go down. And in fact, if you had an infinite, a truly infinite universe, with in existing for an infinite amount of time and over an infinite amount of space, then that would, that would drive all the particle masses to zero. Now, we know, just by looking around us, that the particle masses in our universe are not zero. So that immediately tells us that if our model is correct, then actually the universe is going to end. We predict Armageddon, it's the main prediction of our, um, of our theory, that uh, the universe inevitably has to end, otherwise we wouldn't have a universe with particle masses in, and we do. So, so the cancellation of the cosmological constant is achieved through it, it, it has this knock-on effect that the universe has to be finite. It would predict that uh, the universe grows from its initial singularity, grows out of it, and then it reaches a maximum size, and then drives into a, a big crunch. And literally at the big crunch, time and space completely ceases to exist. So time only exists for a finite, finite length of time. And otherwise the particle masses would, would, would have been zero. This is if you're right. If we're right, yes, yes. You do know the mass of the particles in the universe. Yes. Does that mean you know the number attached to the cosmological constant? What number did you spit out? Okay, so in our theory uh, there is a like a residual leftover piece that you get. So the cancellation leaves a little bit left over. And um, that is now that number is smaller the bigger the universe gets. Okay, so that we're able to show that it's less because the universe is as big as it already is, that it's smaller than than some critical value that so doesn't screw up any so any it's cosmology. Constantly, it's constantly ticking. It's constantly changing. Well, it depends. I mean, it's it, it's set. It's a number. It's fixed. So the universe is going to get as big as it's going to get, right? It's not that it changes with time. Just that we know that the universe is as big as it is now. So this number can't be any bigger than this particular value. Um, so you know, yeah. What's the original question? <laughs> I what's forgot. The number? It's not bigger than the dark energy density. Which is what? Um, it's a milli electron volts to the fourth, so whatever that is. You want that? You wouldn't want that. This is the smoking gun to me. That I love the exact numbers, you know that. It's not, it, well, I mean, we don't know how, how long the universe is going to last for, right? So we can't, I can't possibly answer your question. I just know it's not bigger than, than the dark energy density.